everyone. Thanks for checking out another podcast. I'm excited today to have Professor Rebecca Earl from Warwick University with me. So she's a professor of history, and she specifically focuses her research on the history of food. And this is a policing podcast, so at first glance, you kind of may be like wondering, what is what does the history of food have to do with policing? Well, when I was an officer, when I was still working as a police officer, I read her book, Body of the Conquistador, and it was about how basically how food was utilized by the Spanish during the early stages of the conquest and well into the conquest as a way, as a, as a tool to control both Europeans in the Americas as well as the native population in the Americas. And with all that's been happening, I thought it would be really interesting, with, specifically with policing and race in America, I thought it would be really interesting to go back as far as we can to like 1492 and talk about what, social control european social control looked like in the americas in those very early stages and i thought she would be a really interesting person to have a conversation with about that so we talk about the the history of food social control in the americas what sort of policing would look like in that type of an environment and then how race was constructed along in this process which i think is also fascinating so i really appreciate her time um, and i hope you guys enjoy this and find this insightful if you do please uh, like follow subscribe on whatever platform you're on and check out my website thomasowenbaker.com um for for more content and thank you very much sit back and enjoy Hey, I wanted to thank you again for for joining me. I really appreciate the time. Um, I did a brief intro so that people know who you are and the type of work you do, but um, just so people maybe have an idea of your lens, your perspective, and where you're coming from, can you tell us a little bit where you grew up? I grew up mostly in upstate New York. Okay, and what took you uh, over overseas, to over to England? I, after I finished my undergraduate studies in the U.S., I applied for and was successful in winning a scholarship for a couple of years of postgraduate study. That was in the 1980s, and it was for a two-year fellowship, so I thought I was going to go for two years, and I just never left. Oh, so you fell in love with your, your time over there, and the fellowship was uh, to study history, or what were you studying at the time? Well, I was studying mathematics, actually. Okay, I saw that in your bio. It's kind of, when you I think of mathematics and I think of history, I think of two different worlds what uh what drew you from mathematics into uh into history well in some ways they're not as different as you might imagine i think they both involve constructing an argument and they both involve making making a logical argument with according to whatever the rules of the discipline are I mean, it's a different kind of argument in mathematics and in history but in both cases you're trying to say this thing can be connected to this thing and leads to a series of events that when you put them together make something bigger so they're not totally disconnected yeah there's there's a relationship what was there what was the bridge was there a particular event was there a, a person that you met an opportunity that you were exposed to that made you realize oh i could move from from mathematics into history was there was there some particular event no i would say in some ways i reached the the limit of my capacity of mathematics. Like, you know, I was a good mathematician as an undergraduate, and you know, I, I don't think I was ever cut out to be a research academic for mathematics. So I think I did as much as I could. And you, you study food uh, and the history of food. What, uh, what, what drew your attention to that, to that subject? Was uh, was there anything in particular that that made you drew your attention or made you interested in that topic? Well, my background was as a historian was really in Spanish American history. So I'd been working on topics related to, well, to a whole variety of different things having to do with Spanish America. But I got, I've, I've, I'm interested in food anyway. I, I enjoy, I find it a, a creative activity. So it's not that food had nothing to do with my life, but it had nothing to do with my academic life particularly. But at a certain, actually, I remember precisely when it was that I started thinking about this. I was in an extremely boring conference, and my mind was wandering. And I was thinking, I was had been teaching a module that I was getting a bit tired of teaching. And I was thinking, well, what would I like to teach? And I sort of, in this rather boring um, afternoon of hearing conference papers, I it occurred to me that it would be interesting to construct a, a history of Latin America told through food, which, I mean, I certainly wasn't the first person in the world to think of that, but I... I thought in this context when I was, you know, my mind was wondering that that would make an interesting way of constructing a module. And so I started 
I put that together. And so for a number of years, I taught a history of Latin America through food. And it was really through my teaching that I started to become interested in this as a research topic. And then out of that and out of the readings that I was doing for this, this undergraduate module, I, I started to become quite interested in the ways in which food was very important to the early experience of colonialism in Spanish America. And that then led to a big piece of research on food, colonialism, and understandings of human difference in the colonial period in Spanish America. And then out of that came of a larger interest in the ways in which these foods from Latin America traveled around the world. And I became particularly interested in potatoes as the most emblematic food from the Americas, which has gone everywhere and which everybody thinks of as totally local. Nobody thinks it's exotic. Right. Yeah, you think of it as a like an Irish uh, food, or uh, but you don't. It's something that originated in the in the Andes. Is that exactly? Okay. Yeah. And um, so the the reason I wanted to speak with you was with what's happening in the world and in the policing world right now, and um, the the the, uh, the the conversation about race in America and social control in America, and it reminded me of your your book and. It, which may sound strange, but just the origins of social control in the Americas, what European social control, and um, I thought it would be just interesting to step to step out of our own time for a little bit and put our 21st century mind on the shelf and maybe just look at the, these issues through a different lens. And I thought, well, what would be a better than like say 1492, you know, this idea in, in the American mind that this is the beginning of some new thing. Well, well during that period, what did social control look like? But be before we before we go there, can you just set the stage a little bit? When when I, I think of Spain or my people listening to this think of Spain, we probably think of a country. We think of a government and uh, armies and a complicated bureaucracy that has control over territory and administers justice. And but that may be we may be a, you, would you call it like a historical fallacy, like where we we have these. Uh, I'm, I'm probably screwing up the terminology. Can you can you just describe what was Spain in 1492? What was what was it? Oh, well, historians sometimes call it a composite empire. So, I mean, you're right to talk about, to think about questions about s social control, about armies, about the administering of justice, etc. So those are features of states. And so people in political science study the origins of states and whether there was something that was different in terms of European history that was going on in the 1400s and 1500s in terms of the nature of statecraft. So the whole debate about the origins of the modern state and what are the features of the modern state and when did it first emerge. So that's a huge topic. You're absolutely right about that. And Spain in 1492 was, so it was a monarchy, and it was a monarchy that comprised a whole series of different territories, some of which were in what we now think of as Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula, some of which were in Eastern Europe, and that involved regions that we now think of as parts of Austria, Hungary, etc. And over the next hundred years or so, Spain um, well, I mean, the other thing to say is that in 1492, Spain was, I, I retreat actually to say it was it was um, a monarchy. It was the region that's occupied by Spain now was the site of a number of different kingdoms. I guess that would be a better way of putting it. That there were, in half of the country or so, there were a whole series of Muslim states in, in um, a whole, well, I mean, in what's now Andalusia, in Cordoba, and a whole, re a whole set of different areas that were part of these these Islamic kingdoms, heading up into Valencia, etc. And in northern Spain was the Christian part, which was connected to, um, these, which became connected to these regions in Eastern Europe. And by the end of 1492, the Muslim kingdoms had been almost completely defeated. And so these Islamic states had been, had been beaten militarily by um, a very expansionist and aggressive northern Spain, the, the Christian part of Spain. And so Columbus's 
arrival in the Americas in 1492 coincided with the fall in, of the last separate Islamic kingdom in Grenada. So by the end of 1492, what I said was correct, that Spain was a, this composite monarchy. The beginning of 1492, there were still um, Muslim states. And so, so they were like, the, con the this conquest didn't start in the America, didn't start in the Americas. It was, it was a consolidation of a, of the space in Europe first for the Spanish empire. Is that fair to say? Like, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the people who subsequent Christian Spanish chroniclers who wrote about this connected all these things together. And so they saw the, um, the defeat of Islam in the Iberian Peninsula, and also one should add the expulsion of all Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, which also occurred in 1492. They saw Columbus, the fall of Grenada, and the expulsion of the Jews as all connected as part of a sign of divine providence, that they were, you know, they were riding a wave that was um, with the backing of, of, of God. And so, so this is like a it's not uh, those are not separate projects then this is this is a uh, god is intervening in the world in the minds of the people like the people in power that there there's this divine mission and it's a consolidation of power on the iberian peninsula but then that should extend how how far in their in the minds of the spanish at this time well i mean they talked about the empire on which the sun never sets i mean the i mean the other factor to add to all of this is the reformation that was going on in europe and which was challenging what came to be called the Catholic Church at the time. And so there was also much discussion subsequently after the, the invasion of the Americas and after Europeans established colonial control in Mexico and Peru, there was much discussion of how these new souls who were being gained for Christianity in the New World, in the Americas, compensated for all the misguided individuals who'd been lost to Christianity by following Luther and by... Oh. Uh, paying attention to the, you know, the mistaken beliefs of what became Protestantism. So that was seen as there was like an, a divine um, balance, a scale that, you know, gains in one hemisphere um, balanced out losses in the other. So it was like a part of a larger battle. So if you, if you're losing souls to Luther, you, you're, you're, that's, I've, I've never, never heard that before. That's, that's fascinating. Um, so you, you, you talked about um, like the, the Muslim, the Muslim population um, at, like they're in op they're in opposition, and this there's this uh, the expulsion of the Jews there, and then we see these horrific acts in the Americas. How we we think of race as something that's well defined. We end something that black, white, Hispanic. You know, we have all these categories. It's this really complex order that we've established. Was what what did that look like? Uh, in 1492, was this? Um, did they conceive of race the same way that we, um, as mo that modern people might? I would say no. This is a topic of again um, much debate among historians. So the old, there's an old story about what we would call race. You know, as a as, which I think all scholars working in in history pretty much would would say is a is a constructed concept so historians try to study when did this idea emerge when did the idea that that race was was real when did this emerge and there's an old story which says it really emerged in the 18th century and that before that people's understandings of human difference were quite distinct from those that we have today and that people didn't think about bodies as having this fixed permanent quality and that rather people thought about your overall existence as being something that was much more fluid and mutable and they thought about differences in terms of religion not in terms of skin color that's kind of the old story and it was argued that with the enlightenment in the 18th century and with the emergence of a kind of a particular kind of science came this idea that race was real and that it was embedded in your body and that you could measure it not just by looking at people but by you know measuring the length of their forearm or the angle of their eyes or their noses and that in the 19th century scientists from Europe went all over the place with calipers measuring people and trying to make scales of you know human superiority and that that's that was race and that before that there wasn't race there might have been discrimination and prejudice but it wasn't race 
So that's the old story you were about to say. No, I was going to say, but that's that's the old story. So there, uh, so there's a new story. What's the new story? And so multiple news stories have emerged. And so one of the news stories says, well, there, one of the news stories, for example, says, well, actually, these ideas about looking at constructing hierarchies of who's superior and who's inferior based on how people look goes back to the beginning of time. There were there are lots of books with titles like The Classical Origins of Racism or things like that, that look at the ancient Greeks or that say these ideas are very old. That's, you know, one kind of thing. But, and this is where the Americas comes into the story, another one of the new stories about race argues that something did change, that there was a before, that there was a time when people didn't really think about race. And then race happened, you know, race was invented, race emerged, but that that wasn't in the 18th century. It was around the time of Columbus. So there's a body of scholarship that suggests that the cause for racial thinking in Europe was European colonialism. And that the start of the expansion of Europeans sailing around the world, encountering people who um, were very different in all sorts of ways and trying to establish colonies through conquest and power, that that was the thing that gave the spark to creating these hierarchies that certain bodies were naturally better than other bodies. And where do you, where do you, it sounds like the, the, la, the last of the, of the explanation seems to be where you currently tend to be leaning. Is that fair to say? Well, I think something important, lots of really important things changed with the advent of European colonialism. But I have a slightly different take on how people, how we should think about human difference. So the, if we go back to the very, what I said was the old story that said it changed in the 18th century and before that people didn't really think about bodies, they thought about culture. So they might discriminate against you because you were Jewish or because, um, because you followed Islam, but it wasn't about how you looked. And you could change your religion, you could convert to Christianity, and then, that, you know, then they wouldn't, you wouldn't be the subject of these prejudices. And so that old story says race is about things that happen in your body that can never change. And things that are about culture, like what religion you follow, or even things that are about class or anything else, those are different. Those aren't things that are happening in your body, and so it's not race. So there's culture on the one hand, and then there's things in your body, and that's race, and they're separate. And when you don't have things happening in your body, but you just have differences built around your lifestyle, your beliefs, your class, all of those things, that's not race, because that's culture, right? Right. Different kind of prejudice. Right. I think the two things are actually really entangled. Uh -huh. So in some ways, I would say the entire premise for making this distinction about, you know, when did race start is based on a slightly faulty understanding of how we think about culture and bodies. So I think that all kinds of prejudices emerged with European colonialism and all kinds of hierarchizing of bodies saying these types of bodies are superior to those types of bodies. A lot of that happened with colonialism, but it was accompanied by a belief that your lifestyle and your culture and how you behave materially affected your body. So if you changed your lifestyle, I don't know where my hands are turning off on this video. If you, change, yeah, if you changed your lifestyle, that that could change your body. And so they're not really separate. So in the Americas, the Spanish colonialism was premised on the idea that European bodies were better than indigenous bodies in lots of ways. But they also believed that if indigenous people stopped behaving like indigenous people and adopted a whole series of lifestyle packages, including food, mm -hmm. that were typical of, of Europeans, that they would perhaps change to have a different type of body. So being indigenous was always discriminated against, but an individual indigenous person was offered this kind of possibility that they could stop being indigenous. So it wasn't... Racism or is that, is that, you know, how does one call that? It's certainly unpleasant. Yeah, and it's, it's different. So it's a different way of thinking about it because we think, I think today we think of race as a, as a, as a biological category someone is born into. But you're saying that it was sort of a mix that there was, you may have, 
you may have had certain qualities in the mind of the minds of these Europeans. Someone may have had certain qualities, physical qualities, but those physical qualities were not permanent, that they were influenced by their environment and by their behavior, what they consumed, their their culture. So the two were not, we think of them as, as culture and biology as being separate. And in the minds of the people who are uh, running the conquest, the they're, they're tangled together. Is that fair to say? Exactly, exactly. So they absolutely thought of physical characteristics as embodied, but they didn't think your body was unchangeable. And in some ways, we don't think our bodies are unchangeable anymore either. I mean, some of the developments in the field of epigenetics, for example, talk about the way in which changes in your own during your lifetime can have a material effect on your body in all sorts of ways. And so for trauma, I mean, we've, there's been a lot of research showing that, you know, people being exposed to trauma changes your, bo your, your body and that your, even your children's uh, physical, you know, it's a good carry on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's some many famous studies looking at, you know, children who were conceived to, to women who would um, been themselves, I think, um, conceived during the Second World War and who were, you know, there's a, an effect clearly of maternal trauma which is being transmitted to these young girls which then affects the next generation. So I mean there's all kinds of evidence about how let's say acquired characteristics during your lifetime can even be passed on genetically. Absolutely. So, yeah so exactly we don't so that old model that culture and bodies are totally separate isn't really how we think today completely either. So it's, it may have been that this old model of them being separated that we're returning to something that was before before that period a more nuanced understanding of the connection between biology and culture than we had you know say a couple a couple of hundred years ago maybe the maybe the the, the uh in 1492 they had a better not a better but a uh something that was more in line with reality than than a hundred years later <laughs> maybe i mean yeah it's, I mean, people in the past weren't stupid. They had different ways of thinking about things, and they didn't always think about things in the ways that we, we find convincing, but people had structures of thought. And yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot to be said for the way that people in Europe, and, and I mean, these are actually ideas that originated, a lot of them, in the Islamic world. Um, in, you know, in Baghdad in the 10th century, etc., that became very influential in Europe as well. Lots of those ideas about the interconnections between your lifestyle and your body and your state of mind and your health, all of them seem sort of commonsensical to me, that how much sleep you get, what diet you eat, how, what sort of exercise you take, what your general frame of mind is, that all of these things affect your health. That was common sense in 1492, and I think it's not crazy now. And so we, so we have these these. Uh, people with very different ideas about how the body works and how and race and you know that they're seeing the world in a different way and they 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 come to the Amer they come to the Amer the Americas. Um, they're not they're not soldiers or part of so see I just think when if I were to think of uh, the Spanish coming to the Americas you think of boats full of soldiers with people with ranks highly organized with like a structure and that there would be these enforcement mechanisms for maintaining rules and laws in the Americas is that is that accurate uh, was there sort of a, like a was there a formal structure in place in the Americas to enforce laws and hold people accountable if they violated the law? There certainly was. So um, the colonial process, or, you know, I mean, basically what we should really think of as Europe invading the Americas was that certainly wasn't a tidy process. I mean, the overthrow of the, you know, what was the so-called Aztec empire in, in central Mexico, that wasn't, that was organized and there were people who had different ranks and different categories, but the entire expedition was sort of even, it was illegal even within the Spanish rules. I mean, you could say the whole thing was illegal. It was, you know, Spain was just invading another sovereign nation. But the people who were doing the invading, particularly Hernán Cortés and his crew, were actually people who had sort of embarked from Cuba against the rule, the, the, the um, wishes of the Spanish governor in Cuba and just sort of a bunch of people who would just set off on their own and sort of formed them, you know, a kind of militia and then 
you know, went off, involved, involved themselves in this military exploit that they didn't have any approval for, even on the Spanish side, right? Right. And which was, you know, and Spanish jurists at the time were concerned about the legitimacy of the conquest. There were quite serious debates in Spain between jurists who were saying, yeah, it's absolutely fine. Of course we can do this. These people aren't civilized, so of course we can overthrow them. It's no problem. And there were other people who were saying, wait, no, we can't. They're, you know, these were kingdoms. We have no right to do this. I mean, there was a discussion of this at the time. But one of the things that was very striking about the colonial state that the Spanish did implement in the centuries after they after Columbus was that it was highly bureaucratized it was an extremely organized structure with um, supreme courts with um, governors with a civil administration with a religious structure that was kind of superimposed on it um, a judicial system a military system so it was highly bureaucratized that's one of the reasons that it's relatively um, it's not easy to study, but there's lots of documentation from the colonial period because the Spanish were very big on producing things and, you know, triplicate, so to speak, or, you know, multiple copies of documents filed in multiple repositories. So there's a huge amount of information about the bureaucracy that they implemented. What? So, like, Cortez leaves Cuba, they burn, you know, burn sh their ships and they're on, you know, and then I think they send people to like stop him. I I'm not a historian. Am I, am I correct? So there's like this effort to stop him. Um, what, why were the Spanish authorities so ineffectual in their ability to control these conquistadors? So they have these, these so so uh, can we call them soldiers or should we not call them so um so they're they're sent they're in the americas they're th part of this conquest you've had this consolidation of power in in europe and now they're expanding and it seems like this is a coherent sort of in many respects this is like a concerted effort to expand an empire um but then you have these these armed men ran, you know running around doing whatever they please and not following the law the orders of the king why why was why was the crown incapable of controlling them well it was far away from spain and there weren't that many officials so there's there are lots of examples from the early colonial period of individuals being sent over as governors. So, you know, somebody in the Spanish court would say, oh, okay, right, we have this new territory in Cuba or wherever we need to send over a governor, we need some administrative structure. But the governor is one person, and there may be a number of individuals who have competing ambitions. So there are lots of examples of, you know, governors of turning up and saying, well, this is the rule and I'm in charge, and people saying, you know, you certainly aren't, and um, killing them or putting them out to sea in a leaky boat or, you know, I mean, there were, there, there was real difficulty in the early decades of this establishment of the Spanish colonial state in establishing the rule of law. It wasn't something that happened from the start. It was an effort from the start, but it took quite a while. And so what, what would, what would that look like if, uh, if, if in, in Cuba, before Cortez heads off to, to, to Mexico, if someone had, say, committed a homicide or uh, done something that was clearly illegal or violated the, the law in some way, in a serious way, how would the, the, the governor or the authorities, who, who would be in, like, how would that work? Would, how would they, would they arrest somebody, send them back to Spain, try them there? How did that work? All of those could be done. So, I mean, a really good illustration of this is something that happened in the early 1500s. In, so, reports were filtering back to Spain about what was happening, including some uh, very explicit reports about the atrocities that were being committed against indigenous people. And some of these reports were troubling enough to the Spanish monarchy that they issued a series of what were called the new laws, which prohibited a lot of these practices. And so these, these laws were then, they were issued in Spain, they then needed to be implemented in the Americas. And the implementation was no easy matter. And, you know, effectively they weren't because they involved outlawing a whole series of things that had become um, common practice. So, for example, indigenous people had been basically, you know, rounded up and divvied out to individual conquistadors and Europeans as a labor force and they'd been told, okay, you actually now have to go work for this 
I mean, effectively as, in, as slave labor for these new these Europeans. And so that sort of practice was outlawed. And I mean, it was effectively a dead letter in a number of parts of the Americas because there wasn't a mechanism for enforcing it. Now, on the other hand, if somebody had committed a homicide, one Spaniard against another, then the Spanish community, I think, had a certain collective interest in enforcing justice. And, you know, that may or may not have been something that would have proceeded according to Spanish legislation, depending on, um, you know, interest groups on either side. But so it wasn't, I mean, on, to say that it was a, a law-abiding society would be a completely untrue and would be flying in the face of the fact that all of this was happening in the context of a, a massive land grab. And but go ahead. the implementation of Spanish legislation by its own lights, even that had a checkered career. So, so it's a patchwork, it's fair to say, and maybe ad hoc, like thrown together like a I, I think of in North America, settlers coming together and saying, hey, Joey killed so so and so. Let's get together and 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 seize him. Like it's a it's an ad hoc kind of a thing can, thrown together in the last minute. Um, I would say not so much. I mean, the Spanish state was very good at issuing legislations, at legislation at codifying it. At, so there was it wasn't ad hoc in the sense that it wasn't that there were no laws. It was the extent to which it was possible to enforce them. Okay, so there's 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 a law that's violated, but the actual nuts and bolts of enforcing it that that would be something that would need to be organized based on the circum the, the circumstances that were faced in the early colonial period. And over time, the Spanish state grew in its reach and strength and power, and it was extraordinarily effective. I mean, it was partly because it was able to count on a lot of support from various sectors of colonial society, which was an extremely litigious society. So people all, at, you know, many different people in colonial society engaged with the colonial court system, from indigenous villagers to members of the nobility. So this was an, a, you know, a society that embraced the potential of, of, leg, of legislation in many different levels. And so, so, so we, have, we have a picture of, of this basic enforcement mechanism, and then we're going to talk about less formal, well, I guess it, it's still formal, but these other forms of control where, do you, do you feel as though the, the distance that was involved so like the fact that these spaniards are so far away from spain um and that it's much more difficult to control them with the ways that they might have in europe do you feel as though that that um that that created an environment where the spanish authorities felt as though they needed to control the diets of of these people more than they would have if they'd been back home <laughs> I don't think the concerns about diet had so much to do with that. I think that the concerns about diet were connected to how people thought about how their bodies operated. And they thought about how their bodies operated in a way that was in some ways consistent. It didn't matter. The, the, the model that people had for good health was the same model for whether, depending, it didn't matter whether you were in Madrid or you were in Mexico City. The larger model was the same. But what you needed to do to be healthy in Mexico City might be different from what you needed to do if you were in Madrid. So, and, go ahead. No, no, after you. Um, so, can you can you step back a little bit? And maybe talk about that. This it's this humor, like you talk about in the book. These humor humors, ga Galenic humorism, like this. Uh, it yeah. seems very strange to a person who's never been exposed to it. Can you just maybe set the stage with that a little bit? What what that is, and in the minds of these these folks, what that meant to them. Yeah, so these are so uh, Galen was a, a um, ancient physician, and his name is often associated with these ideas. But these are really ideas that go back. I mean, I think they they were quite widespread across um, both the Islamic world and I mean Baghdad was a particular center of scholarship and knowledge, but also spread into Europe through the Middle Ages. Well, well before that, from the ancient from ancient times through the Middle Ages, and which were really long lasting in terms of how people thought about their bodies. And that was what I was referring to a little bit when I was saying, well, the idea that what you eat or how much exercise you take affects your overall well-being, and that's not so crazy. Those are ideas that come out of this world. And so the way people thought about their bodies was that your body was 
composed of a balance of humors. You had these different humors, blood, phlegm. I mean, the names sound odd to us, but let's just, let's just think about them as different qualities that are in your body. And the balance of those different qualities in your body affects all sorts of things about you. It affects your appearance. So people who are sanguine, who had a lot of blood, we might be ruddy and healthy, you know, an idea that we still might have a little bit. People who were, had a predominance of the melancholic humors of black bile, they might be smaller, quite hairy on the darker side. They would, you know, they would have a particular physique that was associated with that balance of humors. And what you, your humoral balance was sort of affected by what you inherited from your parents. So you might get some kind of blend of their qualities, but it also changed over your lifetime. So people tended to, to become colder and drier over their lifetime. And so you didn't have a fixed humoral balance. It was a, a journey through your humoral balance over your lifetime. And it was really just a way of talking about, you know, your body's, your constitution and your emotional mindset. And those things were seen as linked. Just the same way the word sanguine now can mean somebody who's basically, you know, has a kind of calm personality, right? That comes from this humoral idea that, that's, that they're, they have a predominance of blood and that gives them a certain emotional temperament. So that's your basic humoral balance. But all these other things can throw your humoral balance out of order or into disequilibrium if you change your diet dramatically. This is seen as being a huge stress to your body, which is reflected in a change in your humors, and that can make you ill. Or it can make you healthy if you were ill and you correct your bad diet, right? Mm -hmm. Fix your diet, you might get healthy. It seems like a, ra seems like a very rational uh, approach. <laughs> So, I mean, they expressed it through these different languages of this particular food will help build up these good humors. But I mean, the basic idea is that your diet affects your health for better or worse. The same way how much sleep and how much how your rest and your movement was considered important. So whether you got a good night's sleep was important to your humoral balance, how much exercise you took was important to your humoral balance, the environment that you lived in, so the airs that you breathed, the waters you drank, the environment surrounding you, that affected your health. They also thought that your emotions affected your health. So that if you were subject to um, terrible sadness and grief, that that would have an effect on your health and it would throw your humors out of whack, but you maybe you could correct it by changing your exercise regime. Yeah. You, I think that you, if you stepped into a, a doctor's office today, that you may hear some of the some of the same things that you know we're we have our biology, but we're influenced by how, you know the diet, our exercise, sleep, um, stress. Changing your diet when you're under stress may you know these these things do make sense, but they're they're sort of they they they're the explanation for why it worked with these humors, that's what sort of throws us off. But the underlying ideas, there seemed to be some real wisdom there. Yeah, so I think it's sort of an interesting model. But And if you kind of go behind this language of, um, of saying, you know, this food has these humoral qualities and think about what are they fundamentally saying. They're saying if you have these sorts of ailments or conditions, this food might be good for you. You know, maybe we would think the same thing. So, so, I mean, that's sort of the basic model. And, but that explains why changes in your lifestyle might be thought of as things that could change your overall body. And what was the concern? So there, there's this effort to control the, the diet, diets. What, what was the concern? Was there a, uh, a political or security concern that if the, if the people that, they were, that were going to the, to the Americas changed their diets and environments, that they would, they would turn into the, to natives? Is that something they were concerned about? Yeah. So, I mean, I should say, I don't think that the – and this was a concern that was widely shared by many, many, many settlers. So this wasn't just something that was coming, you know, sort of from a, a, a control structure, but individuals who traveled from Europe to the Americas were themselves worried about what was going to happen to them if they lived in a different environment, if they were subject to different airs and waters, if they ate very unfamiliar foods, if their 
overall life's radically disrupted. They were worried that they would fall ill. So this was a widely shared common sense idea. So, you know, ordinary soldiers worried about this and they said, well, we're all going to get ill because we're eating the wrong food. So it was, it was a widely shared concern, but it also was connected to colonial governance because there was this sort of both a hope and a fear that Europeans sh harbored that if indigenous people in particular adopted more European mores and more European foods, for example, that they would become more like Europeans. And so that was on the one hand very appealing to sort of philosophers of colonialism because the justification of colonialism from a colonial perspective was this sort of promise that you were, you know, you were bringing something beneficial to the people you were colonizing. You were offering them the opportunity to, um, you know, climb up some ladder of civilization, and that if they only change their behavior, then these colonized people could become more like the colonizers. This is the promise of colonialism everywhere. This is what, you know, all colonial endeavors do. They say, you people, what you're doing isn't good enough, but if you do what we do, you can become like us, and that would be so much better for you. And food was one of the ways in which this promise was was it was part of the package. Stop eating the food you're eating. Start eating the food that we're eating, which is better food, and you'll get you know you'll become like us. So there was there was this sort of hope. But on the other hand, supposing that had really happened, supposing that had been possible, supposing all indigenous people, you know, from the um, the Mapuche in southern Chile to um, to the, you know the Navajo said, yeah, fine, okay, we're going to totally adopt European lifestyles. We're going to do everything you want us to do. And supposing it had worked somehow in the eyes of Europeans, and all these indigenous people had turned into people who were effectively Spanish. Well, what possible justification would remain for colonialism? What were the Spanish doing, bossing these people around in the first place? If those people were no longer different, if those people were just like them, right? Right. So this promise, do what we tell you and you'll become like us, can never be realized. If it were ever actually realized, the whole justification of colonialism would collapse around itself. So if you're if you're standing there with a with a, a spear or a sword, a sword telling someone to eat a certain way so that they can join your join European, they can become European, once they become European, you no longer have a justification to hold the sword, the legitimacy for holding them with the sword is no longer there. Um, so, so would it be fair to say that in the minds of the, the Europeans that were there, that if, if a, a native person were making a concerted effort to eat the right foods, wear the right clothes, follow the right right i say right with quotes uh mm -hmm. habits that they would that that they would receive better treatment or um that they would uh be treated with more leniency or would, would they be treated differently for for engaging in those behaviors well this is a really really good question so it all depends so people so colonial Sp spanish colonial society was very hierarchically structured i mean you had to be if you were if you were of mixed race, you couldn't go to university. I mean, there were all kinds of rules and regulations about what you could and couldn't do on the basis of your classification within a racial hierarchy, if we can use that term. But it's also very clear that people move through this hierarchy in different ways. And so, um, you know, we can see this in, I don't know, if you look at church records that will record somebody's racial category when they were born and they'll be recorded with you know whatever racial category the priest recording it felt was appropriate and then we can then sometimes you can say fine you can find that same person and they've got they got married and so there's a marriage record and the race that's recorded in the marriage record is different and it's clear that over that person's lifetime, they've moved, you know, they've socially moved to occupy a different category. And how did people do that? Well, they did it in all sorts of ways. At certain stages, you could even buy an official document that would, if you paid enough, a certain amount of money, you could get a document that would officially reclassify you. And that was the official route. Or you moved through it because you adopted behaviors that led other people in your society to view you as occupying a different category. And some of that might have to do with exactly lifestyle things that you were describing. What you wore, for example, was quite important. If you look at court records and they will say, well, 
what did you think? How would you categorize that person? And they would say, well, she always wore this kind of clothing. So I always thought she was indigenous. Right. So, so changing then... lifestyle allowed you to potentially to move into a different category. But it wasn't that it was a simple process and you might not convince, you know, other people might disagree. So, I mean, family members disagreed about how to categorize other relatives. You know, these were, these were reputational contested things. They weren't, uh, you know, they weren't simple. So there are, there are a variety of, so there are uh, formal benefits to presenting a certain way. So like gaining access to certain formal benefits that, that, that those are, those are clear. And then there are also these co complex informal relationships and you're navigating them, you know, and, and there could be benefits at a person in a personal level. Who are the primary gatekeepers of race? Is it the church? Is it, uh, is it, is it, is, there, are there no primary gatekeepers? In a way you could say the community that you live in. So it's very localized. Yeah, I mean, it's very, they're different. I mean, there are all kinds of different measures. So people would construct family trees if you wanted to be, I mean, if you wanted to apply for um, certain positions, you might have to demonstrate that you were entirely of, you know, European origin or, and that that wouldn't require the construction of genealogies. And, but those genealogies were sometimes complicated. You know, people didn't have necessarily birth records for their great, great, great grandparents. Those things might not even have been recorded at the time. That's the recording of birth records is a somewhat modern invention. So what would people do? If somebody wanted to get a position um, in the church that required you to demonstrate so-called purity of blood, um, investigators might go around to the village that your grandparents lived in and say, hey, does anybody remember so-and-so? What was his reputation? How did people consider him? People say, oh, yeah, I remember him. Yeah, we always thought he was a, you know, good Christian. Okay. And it's, and it's, and the way that those signals are sent are, it's complex. It's through your, the totality of the circumstances, how you behave, what you do, how you eat, how you dress, the, your accent, I'm sure all of these things contribute to that. So it's like you're playing, if you want to, if you want to move through society, you have to perform. Uh, yeah, that's a good word. And what, and, and. What so there's these informal mechanisms in place, there's formal mechanisms in place, but there's also um, the state, it, like the state controls what what foods are being sent, like there, there are quotas and like formal rules and mechanisms to make sure people are eating the right things. No, so I would say that's not happening so much. So, I mean, no, so conquistadors weren't going around holding swords to indigenous people and saying, You better eat this. Well, I mean, there were marginal examples I can think of, but that was somebody being sadistic. But there are, um, that, so it wasn't, there wasn't a state policy of forcing indigenous people in this, in that, in a, you know, at the threat of violence. But the, the, and the control of the provisioning system in any region was very complicated and was partly in the hands of, um, you know, and sometimes of indigenous producers who might be producing the food, but also legislators who would control what could be sold at markets, what market structures and rules were employed. So it was a complex situation. The state's biggest concern during the colonial period was providing enough European food for European settlers. They were really worried about not getting enough wine imports from Spain, for example. So that was their big focus. They, they felt wine was essential to the health of Spaniards. And they would have uh, quotas for how much needed to be sent to the, uh, or people needed to buy. How did they manage? How, what, was the, what was the mechanism in place to, to make sure that people were getting enough, enough wine? Well, it was a combination of sort of private enterprise and state-run processes. So this wine was mostly being imported from, from Spain in individual ships. But the local government would write back and report regularly back to Spain, or the viceroy would say, "Well, this is a calamity. None of the ships from Spain have arrived this season, and they haven't. The wine that, or the ones that did arrive, have brought wine which was spoiled, or the barrels leaked, and this is an absolute disaster. And everyone's going to get very ill, and something must be done about this." So, there, it, there wasn't a, a state control of the purchasing and food provisioning system to that degree. So I. Um... In my experience, as a, so I worked as a police officer, now study policing, but I, I remember uh, when I read your book, um, it reminded me of my, uh, of ex 
my work as a police officer and how this was still something that happens, um, this policing of diets. And what I would do, just, what I would do is, and this was a very common practice, was responding to say a domestic violence call at a house. And um, you would look at the way people were living. So the, um, if there were children there while my partner was interviewing a victim, as I would walk through the house, I may take a look in the cupboards. Um, was the house, was the, were the cupboards stocked with food for the kids and what, what food were they eating? Were, were the parents making meals? Were, um, I remember one incident of a domestic violence call and going into the bedroom of the children and seeing the beds being were neatly made by the mom um, and they had like the Disney cover you know bed spreads and all of these things were signals to me as a gatekeeper to the justice system of right. what, what what the value of this particular victim was and as you go as police officers in America and, and other places as well, you just have you have an incredible amount of power to decide what case gets reported you know, who gets a police report, how in depth the investigation is. So there's a lot of power at that level. And it was it was really influenced. I, I didn't it, it's not something I don't think that police officers they intentionally do. I don't think they say, oh, what are these people eating? How are they living? Are they deserving of of justice but i think that in our minds we've been we've been indoctrinated into a culture and we value certain things and for me i noticed when i and I, when i read your book it, remi it reminded me of that this this is something that may not have have gone away do you when you look at the world today do you see states and governments controlling people in a similar way using using food trying to, to change who they are um, for for political reasons as a form of statecraft well that's a i should say that in in three minutes i have to go to another meeting oh i'm sorry so, yes uh, I'll, this will be the last question so um i think there are enormous continuities in um people who are in positions of greater power looking at the lifestyles including the diets of people in less in positions of much less power and evaluating them in terms of whether this person is is sort of deserving or undeserving. So, I mean, this was something that, um, I mean, to give you an example of how people, a hundred years ago, people were doing this. Um, so social workers in New York City in the early 1900s would go around if they were paying, I mean, if they were visiting immigrant neighborhoods, for example, they would very explicitly evaluate the diets of what people were eating and would say, well, these people are just hopeless. They're wasting their money. They don't know how to budget. They don't know how to cook. Look at this. They're wasting all their money on vegetables. I mean, Italian immigrants buying tomatoes, for example, was something that was often criticized as a total waste of money because tomatoes had no nutritive value. You know, uh, this was before the discovery of vitamins. So people <laughs> thought you know, it was just you know, an expensive frippery, right? You know, it was like saying, well, they're just buying tropical fruit. You know, why aren't they feeding their children properly? We would look back and say, actually, we think tomatoes are probably quite important as part of a healthy diet. So, so I think there's enormous continuity in the way in which diet is used to categorize people's worthiness. Let's say, and yeah, I mean, like, does that? No, that 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 to totally makes sense. And um, yeah, so I think it's just as people are moving forward, just the, that there's not. It's not just at the the point with fists and guns that people are controlled their that yes. what they eat how they live and it's complex and um interlocking i guess i i really agree control is social control is rarely just a mention an issue of simply pure physical violence it's usually much more complex i really agree about that so, so I want to thank you very much. I know you've got another meeting. I thank you very much for your time. I'll put a link to the book in the description and uh, to your uh, faculty website so they can follow more of your work.